On the night of the 7th of November, or the, I think the 25th of October in the Russian calendar at the time, uh, a Tsarist commander reported to headquarters the following. The situation in Petrograd is frightful. There are no street demonstrations or disorders, but a regulated seizure of institutions, railroad stations, and also arrests is in process. The Junker patrols are surrendering without resistance. We have no guarantee that there will not be an attempt to seize the provisional government. And in fact, of course, that was precisely what was taking place at that very moment. It was the beginning of the seizure of the, an arrest of the provisional government. And that really was uh, the crowning of the greatest ever revolution in human history. And the insurrection itself was, is surely one of the most audacious and fascinating acts. In other words, the insurrectionary conquest of power by and for the working class. One of the most audacious acts in world history. And an act, of course, with certain parallels with some other th things in history, but really unique, to be honest, in the history of the world, um, as I will attempt to explain. And Lenin was able to explain the next day in the opening session of the Second uh, Congress of Soviets of Russia the following. He said, we shall now proceed to construct the socialist order. And then there was about five minutes of applause or something after that. <laughs> um, now, what has to be understood is the insurrection itself is different from the revolution as a whole. Uh, and in fact, it's its highest expression, its most organised and conscious expression. And it must be studied in its own right, uh, but also because I think it sheds a great deal of light on the, the, the role of leadership uh, and of organisation and, and what exactly power is and what it means to grasp power and to use it to transform society. And I think it's, it's something very understudied, not just uh, in general, but in our own movement and our organization. But I think we should study it in some depth. It's also a study of it, this unique event that stands apart from all the other aspects of the revolution. A study of it is also extremely useful for clarifying uh, and overcoming, if you like, the questions and problems raised by anarchism and, and the likes of the anarchists. Um, because you see very specifically uh, in very detailed, concrete events, what really is involved in changing society and what must be involved in it and what, what you have to do to achieve that. Now, it wasn't Marx, but really so much as uh, the French revolutionary Blanqui, who really first kind of developed and popularised the idea of the revolutionary insurrection for socialist ends, to, for the socialist transformation of society. Um, although for him, his grasp of what that meant, of what socialism meant, was somewhat vague and moralistic. Um, but really he popularised the idea and also put it into practice uh, several times. And for that, Marx really respected Blanqui, despite the massive criticisms and differences. He really respected Blanqui as, as a genuine revolutionary, which, which he certainly was, as self-sacrificing, which of course he, he certainly was, having spent most of his life uh, in, actually in prison. Uh, and he, uh, he was, uh, um, yeah, so he was a genuine revolutionary despite his shortcomings. And Marx praised him as, or rather not so much praised him, but praised the French working class for having uh, Blanqui as, as really their inspirer, really a, tr a true revolutionary, someone very bold and who put the conquest of, of power very clearly uh, on the map. And Lenin and the Bolsheviks, and specifically the act of insurrection in October 1917, all of these were accused of being Blanquiist, essentially. And why were they accused? Why was it a criticism to say that you're a Blanquiist? What did that mean? And of course, why was that wrong? Um, well, to, to say from a Marxist point of view, to say that you're a Blanquiist as a criticism is effectively to criticise you as an adventurist or a voluntarist or a substitutionalist, which terms really mean um, to substitute yourself for the class, for the mass movement, essentially. Uh, Blanqui's ideas really were to have a conspiracy 
of hardened revolutionary, a hard and very small cadre, secretive cadre, who would seize government uh, buildings and institutions in secret on behalf of the working class, and certainly very sincerely and honestly. I don't think that they were power hungry. As, as I said, Blanqui spent most of his life in prison and refused to relent in order to be let free. So very honestly so, but nevertheless conspiratorial in nature. Uh, no real involvement of the working class and not basing it on an already existing mass revolutionary movement of the working class. Very moralistic in character, like we volunteer ourselves to do this because we want to do it at this moment, not because the conditions are right. So it was very adventurist in that sense. Uh, and the, the criticism, the Marxist criticism of, of that is fundamentally not a moralistic one, uh, but that it doesn't work. It's necessary to involve the working class in a mass struggle for power and to in fact base yourself on an already existing mass movement and not really just for moralistic reasons but because of course the socialist transformation of society requires the working class to be actively involved in it first of all to defend it successfully and secondly of course to to make a success of building socialism you can't do it without that, uh, with a passive, uh, with a pa passive relationship uh, of the working class to the insurrection, and that certainly is borne out by what happened with uh, Blanqui and his movement. Uh, for instance, in 1839, his Society of Seasons, which was, um, as it was called, effectively his Revolutionary Party, in 1839 seized several French government buildings and basically proclaimed, you know, the, the end of the government and the establishment of a socialist one. However, with Within a day or two, uh, it was crushed uh, totally, and it was crushed obviously because of the passivity of the working class, because they were isolated essentially. Um, and uh, and Blanqui was thrown into jail, and as I said, ended up spending most of his life in jail. Uh, and he had one or two other opportunities to organise very similar insurrections with the exact same results. And we have, have other examples in history as well of such adventurous methods uh, failing utterly, such as the Canton Commune, the last last desperate act of the Chinese Revolution of 1927, uh, when the communists, realising the error, how disastrous their policy of supporting Chiang Kai-shek had been, suddenly attempted to reverse all of that and go to the opposite extreme and just occupy the, the major city of Canton, or Guangzhou as it's now known, without the support or involvement of the working class. I think about 300 people alone uh, did this. And the workers were more just more or less just confused as to what was going on. And of course they were crushed and thousands of them were executed. So that clearly doesn't work. You need mass participation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, I have to, we have to say that we, we do, I think, owe a debt to Blanqui for putting this idea on the table. And it's not all wrong, and it, it certainly in, in relation to this opportunist idea that you just gradually reform the bourgeois state out of existence or something. Uh, I would say it, there, there's much uh, to go for the idea of the seizure of power uh, in that way. Um, and we do need to have a seizure of power, but of course not an adventurist one, not a, not a conspiratorial one or merely conspiratorial one. Um, and, but Len, if you read Lenin at the time in 1917, most uh, specifically his article, which I sent around, I don't know if anyone read it, on um, the, uh, the Marxism and insurrection, he explains very clearly uh, that the insurrection itself is, is not a mere conspiracy, uh, that it has to be based not only on a mass party, not just a few hundred people or something, but a mass party, but not even just a mass party, but also actually the mass support of an advanced revolutionary class, a, a, an already existing revolutionary upsurge of the people. It needs that to draw strength from, to defend it, uh, and to, to legitimise it, of course. Uh, and anyone who sees the seizure of power in the insurrection of, of October 1917 as a mere conspiracy and coup, just like Blanqui, which they were accused of doing, Doing by the, the Mensheviks and others, uh, is um, uh, and, and even Rosa Luxemburg, I believe, accused them of that, uh, is ignorant of the, the, the whole history of the revolution up to that point, and especially Lenin's famous phrase, patiently explain. Uh, clearly, the whole methodology of the Bolsheviks, and I think the, the previous session really outlines it very well, was not adventurist, was not voluntarist, just ploughing on ahead without reference to the mass movement, but was actually to patiently 
uh, intervene consistently in the mass movements in a non-sectarian manner to support the mass movement, even in its errors, but obviously to criticise those errors and to patiently explain and to patiently win mass support for the revolutionary line of the Bolsheviks, which of course they successfully did. Uh, and Lenin also explains in this article that the, the insurrection would not have been possible to be car carried out in June or July, which as Nicholas explained they were accused of trying to do. It would not have been possible because although in, in Petrograd perhaps the, the conditions were sufficient, elsewhere they were not, the rest of the country was not, uh, was not there politically essentially and they would have been isolated. The peasantry was still really under the influence of the, of the bourgeoisie and, uh, and of the opportunists. Um, hadn't broken from them. You hadn't yet had the experience of the Kornilov coup or the attempt at the coup, which was of decisive significance as we will discuss. Um, and, and there was a lack of confidence. Also, the, in June and July, he points out that the, the enemy, the class enemy, the, the ruling class, the capitalists, had not um, lost fully confidence in themselves, were not divided, were not seen as confused and not having a way out so clearly as they were by October. Uh, so clearly this was not a rash um, adventurist move. It was carefully prepared and planned for and they waited for the right moment, which meant the moment of mass support essentially. Nevertheless, when the moment did come for the, 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 uh, the insurrection, when the conditions were there, Lenin was not only uh, uh, then in favour of it, but was urging for it quite uh, aggressively in fact, uh, absolutely lacerating other members of the Bolshevik party who were prevaricating or were opposed to it for various reasons um, and when was urging and pushing relentlessly for the insurrection. And I like, uh, I think that is also something interesting to dwell upon, the brilliance of Lenin as an all-round Marxist, which is what obviously a Marxist has to be, a dialectician, not fetishizing one particular position or tactic. Usually, you, if a leader, if a political leader pushes caution uh, and generally seems to sort of hold things back, you, you become accustomed to, the, to thinking of that political leader as just always cautious and usually that is the case, you know. But Lenin actually was cautious when he needed to be, very cautious uh, and really, you know, urging patience and so sobriety etc. But then when the conditions changed, grasped that and changed tack himself and pushed uh, for, for, for the total opposite position in, in a sense uh, for, for coming out for insurrection. In that article uh, which really sort of sums up the internal debate and the problems, the political you know, the working out of the political problems of the insurrection within the Bolshevik party before it was put into practice. In that article Lenin quoting Marx refers to the insurrection as an art uh, and he says in doing so that that means you go on the offensive. When you, when you have an insurrection, you have to take advantage of the concrete conditions that you find. You go on the offensive and you don't stop. You keep on exploiting the weaknesses of the enemy, going from victory to victory, pressing home your weakness and exploiting any confusion that there is in the enemy's ranks. And what that means to say that it is an art in that way is basically to say that the insurrection is tactical in the highest degree. In other words, that it has its, a logic of its own own that of course ultimately has to be informed by the general perspectives and obviously if the Bolsheviks didn't have a perspective of the need to t of, the, of the workers to take power they wouldn't have even had the idea of an insurrection but nevertheless once you've accepted that idea, it has its own logic uh, and you have to understand the very concrete conditions, you know, what strategic points are important to occupy, what day of the week might be better to have an insurrection because of this or that consideration, that kind of thing. How ought you to pose in argument the need for an insurrection or how it, that, that kind of thing It's what I think he's getting at when he says it's an art. There's no other way about it. You can't just satisfy yourself with general considerations of, well, the Bolsheviks will come to power eventually because it's in the law of history or something. It's in the sort of general schema of the revolution. You need to enter into the details of the concrete circumstances and actively create an insurrectionary situation and plan for it. <clears throat> now, it, this whole debate that existed in, uh, in the Bolshevik party about whether or not to have an insurrection and, and, and the, um, the winning of that debate, of course, was absolutely vital for having the insurrection in the right way and at the right time 
why did that happen? And I think it's very interesting to dwell upon this and that's why I find I think the insurrection so fascinating is precisely this conundrum of the uh, proletarian revolution. In a pamphlet, a very important pamphlet that Trotsky wrote called Lessons of October, uh, he wrote that I think in 1923 after a, a defeat in the German revolution. Uh, in that pamphlet he explains how the proletariat is accustomed to weakness and the revolutionaries, uh, socialist revolutionaries especially, are accustomed to weakness. In other words, as a revolutionary or as even a worker, you spend your entire life obviously in a sense on the back foot, obviously not having power. And it, to one degree or another, being aware that the enemy has power, being aware that you know it's not up to you to decide how society is run. And, 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 and as revolutionaries, that means there's a certain cautiousness uh, in how you behave. You can't be rash like Blanqui was. You have to carefully weigh up situations. You have to you know, wait basically for the right time. You have to patiently explain explain essentially. And that of course is absolutely correct. Um, but there does come a moment of course when that isn't the case. And those moments are indeed very rare but it does happen in a revolution where suddenly the working class and the revolutionary party are actually not on the back foot, are actually suddenly the strongest force and they may not realise it but they are in fact the strongest force in society and, uh, and have the ability to change society or to run and lead society. Uh, but being so accustomed to caution and afraid of you know, rash steps etc, it's natural for the revolutionary I think, and he says this, to bulk at that final step, if you like, to, to not see it when it's really there, to not really understand the power that you have, to be fearful of openly coming out actually for, for, changing, for, for, for changing society on your terms, not just in the abstract but actually concretely as a specific task that you're going to organise. Um, that's obviously entirely natural. I think that's what Lenin also meant when he said there's no one more conservative than a revolutionary. You spend your whole life Life, talking about it as a future event and as an abstract thing uh, and you could grow so used to that it's actually a very alien and strange thing to you to find yourself in that situation where actually you possibly you could take power and maybe you ought to. So it's quite a scary and strange situation for the Bolsheviks to be in and, uh, and indeed most of the leaders, probably not the ranks of the Bolshevik party but most of the leaders both regionally and nationally in the Bolshevik party uh, spend pretty much the entirety of 1917, including right up to the insurrection, fearful of, of those kinds of steps in one way or another. And you see that, for instance, up to the insurrection, uh, Zinoviev and, and Kamenev uh, writing a letter basically exposing the plans for the insurrection, a complete betrayal of party discipline and unity. Um, and Lenin t referred to them as strike breakers quite correctly in, in doing so and wanted to have them expelled from the party. Uh, they were so terrified that they were prepared to sabotage the insurrection and the party as a whole. And there are many, many other examples of that. Stalin, of course, was opposed to it and basically just disappeared for the whole of that time, as he tended to do at decisive moments. Uh, but that was quite a normal mood. In fact, uh, Lenin, when, when lacerating them, as I said, when attacking them as, as pathetic and not understanding the tasks of the day, uh, that he was writing them letters he was in hiding at the time uh, because of the July days and the, the reaction existed. He was writing them letters, uh, some of which were actually, I think one of them was burnt by the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party. So horrified and terrified were they by what he was saying. I would say that I don't think that attitude was necessarily repeated in the Bolshevik party as a whole and the ranks of it who were probably more uh, revolutionary but the leaders who felt the weight of responsibility I think were much more cautious, uh, far too cautious and that I think uh, really and also Trotsky makes a, a, a connected point to this which is also fascinating I think which is that he points out that because of this fact you see this decisive, this very qualitative difference between the bourgeois revolution and the workers' revolution. The, the bourgeois, and Alan referred to this in his earlier talk, saying that you know the bourgeois revolution doesn't really have to be that conscious of what it's doing. Hence, Cromwell uh, being, you know, thinking he was establishing the kingdom of God on on earth and not a capitalist society. Um, 
the bourgeois revolution doesn't ha is, is, is more confused about itself and doesn't have such a high degree of planning and organization because the bourgeoisie, even though they're an oppressed class under feudalism, they do have at their disposal uh, various banking institutions such as the city played a key role in supporting Cromwell uh, in, the, in the English Revolution. You know, they have the universities, they have general power, and also they're not aiming to abolish privilege and, and class society as a whole. So to a certain extent, they can even bribe sections of the old ruling class who, if they can make money out of uh, a new capitalist society, probably the, many of the feudal landlords are quite happy to go along with it. Uh, so it's kind of, in a sense, it's easier or rather less, has to be less resolute and clear about what it's doing, I think. But of course, the workers' revolution does aim to abolish class uh, inequality, or cl the whole class system as a whole, and privilege, etc., in its entirety. So you can't really bribe the old ruling class into accepting it. You can't sort of muddle your way through. Uh, I suppose you could say that reformism and the welfare state would be an, an equivalent attempt at bribing the capitalists into accepting socialism, gradually building it up around them, like the bourgeoisie put its pieces in place for running a capitalist society. Obviously it didn't work because it's not in the capitalist interest to give up all privileges uh, and to live as ordinary people in a socialist society. So for that reason what Trotsky says is that the workers' revolution requires uh, a party in the place of the the press, the bourgeois press, and the bourgeois universities, and all the other institutions that even under feudalism the capitalists have. In the place of that, the workers have the party, which is far more clear, far more class conscious, far more aware of what its tasks really are uh, than the than the uh, bourgeois parties were in their revolution. Uh, but and that in also I think sums up the kind of weightiness of this this decisive step that you're taking, you know, which is is really to begin the abolition of the class system as a whole and hence these the, the, the fractiousness of this debate within the Bolshevik party and hence in almost all other revolutions the failure of the party or the so-called revolution party of course it turned out not to be to take that final decisive step uh, to organize um, uh, the taking of power <coughs> And Trotsky also points out that the, the, the point of view of those in the Bolshevik party opposed to the insurrections, in particular Zinoviev, of course came up with a whole host of excuses for why we shouldn't take power. They refer to just how dangerous the enemy was. Uh, of course, refer, it, this is, uh, it makes sense in light of what I said about the revolutionaries being used to being on the back foot. Uh, he refers to the, the artillery rained outside of um, Petrograd pointed at it and he, you know, he lists a whole series of terrifying military kind of entanglements that they would be faced with. And of course none of it really materialised because in the act of organising an insurrection and showing a way forward, they were able to actually dissolve those military organs essentially, those reactionary military organs and, and the rank and file of them effectively were won over to the revolution and they were not able to use that. But of course you can't find that out once and for all until you actually take that step, although you can be pretty sure that you'll be able to win them over. Uh, but you can't really prove that and, other than by the act of actually organising the seizure of power. And uh, Trotsky points out that, of course, had they not seized power, and they certainly wouldn't have done, I think, had Lenin not been in, in the leadership of the party, had they not done that, then actually what would have happened is it would have petered out, basically. Uh, the masses would have become disillusioned, uh, because they would, and they would have begun to see the Bolsheviks as yet, an, basically, another version of the Mensheviks, all talk and no action, you know, not actually prepared to, to do anything weak and prevaricating, etc. And they would have therefore become demoralised and wouldn't have organised an insurrection spontaneously and uh, gone home, essentially. And then, of course, afterwards, the sort of Bolshevik intellectuals could write these kind of, you know, it would, it would, it's a basically a self-fulfilling prophecy because afterwards you would say, look, the workers have become passive, they obviously weren't prepared to fight for the rest. Revolution. It's a good thing that we didn't organise any kind of rash insurrection. And of course, the middle class intellectuals are accustomed to dismissing the workers in that way, not calling the workers out, not trying to use their positions to, to inspire the workers. They demoralise the workers and then blame the workers for that demoralisation. That's quite a typical uh, state of affairs. And I think also that shows the genius of Lenin 
uh, and the brilliance of Lenin as a revolutionary in that um, he understood uh, and certainly put into practice the ability of a leadership to transform one and the same situation. I think that's really you know, clearly the key lesson of the Bolsheviks, that the very same situation, the very same balance of class forces um, uh, can be transformed one way or another by the presence or otherwise of a determined leadership that's prepared to act. Um, and action decides everything, you know, in those kinds of circumstances. Um, and that's not, an, and some people say, well, maybe Lenin wasn't really a materialist then. Maybe Lenin wasn't really a Marxist uh, because he sort of denigrated the sort of iron laws of history and in place of them put the, the sort of subjective power of leadership to change history almost at will, which is of course nonsense. It's not at will. They had to patiently explain for months. They had to have a mass movement in place uh, and also to be, for their patient explaining to be successful, it had to connect with the real mood, the real situation and what was there. And also obviously having decided on an insurrection to make a success of it, they needed to have the active and passive support of the mass of the class and, and you know to, to actually have the thousands of red guards and things that you need to actually do it again how do you manage to find at your disposal thousands of red guards you can't just do that out of sheer willpower so of course it's not anti-materialist uh, to say such a thing however a materialist understands that an individual or a party uh, which is itself part of the structure of society can alter uh, what goes on in society can change the course of history depending on what its own position is. Um, now, onto the insurrection itself and how it was done. I think that the insurrection, as is known, was an extremely smooth affair, really, in, in, especially in, in Petrograd, which is, of course, the decisive place. Um, very well organised and very calm and peaceful, as the quote I gave at the beginning of the talk in, uh, indicated. But that was possible, I think, because of the perspectives uh, that the Bolsheviks had, because of the confidence that they had in the masses. And the political tactics they worked out on the basis of those perspectives uh, were so brilliant. In particular, as Trotsky points out, using the defensive mask of Soviet legality in order to organise technically the taking of power. And that, again, that was possible because of their, perspe their perspectives and understanding of the revolution. The Bolsheviks from the beginning, in fact, with, in the case of Lenin right back to 1905, understood the, the Soviets as for what they really in implication were, which is potential organs of working class power. Not as just talking shops or sort of nice ways to check the, the, the bourgeois and hold them and, you know, to sort of push the bourgeois in a certain direction. But actually it's a new kind of power structure um, according to the interests and position of the working class in society and therefore their existence alongside uh, a bourgeois parliament in the case of the provisional government uh, meant a situation of dual power uh, and that meant that that situation could not last forever you can't have dual power in society for a sustained period of time you can't have two different powers resting on different classes with different interests sort of sitting side by side and sort of checking one another at one at one time one of them is going to have to dominate the other and dis dismiss it but for a period of time of course the, the provisional government did have to essentially get the approval of the soviets for anything it wanted to do, and that's really dual power. Uh, amazingly, no one else really seemed to grasp the significance of that. The Mensheviks, the SRs and others didn't really see what it was, I think, and neither did Stalin and others. They saw it as, a, as I say, a sort of check on just another kind of uh, instrument, like, I don't know, like having a kind of left-wing newspaper might be an instrument to influence politics. Just another instrument with which you might influence the political setup or what was happening in society, rather than as an actual organ of power, which it clearly was. But the Bolsheviks under Lenin's leadership understood that, and they therefore could pose certain demands such as all power to the Soviets, which at first glance may not appear revolutionary, or may not appear as sectarian, which they were accused of being. Um, well, it wasn't sectarian, but it may appear as a sort of, a sort of mild demand, just saying, well, look, the, the Mensheviks should, should run society through the Soviets. But of course, they understood that the Mensheviks couldn't do that, and that was because the, the Soviets, to run society, that would really mean fundamentally the working class leading the revolution 
and pushing the bourgeoisie out. So they could pose that as a demand knowing that it wouldn't be fulfilled by the opportunists and in posing it of course they would win the kudos for posing it and would be able eventually to win the support they needed to take that power themselves through the Soviets. Um, so they understood that um, <clears throat> And therefore, I think the whole tactics of the insurrection have really flowed from that understanding quite brilliantly. And uh, the situation of dual power had, had developed quite dramatically towards, clearly was developing towards a sort of a finale, if you like, by the time of the, certainly by the time of the Kornilov coup, which again, the others didn't really understand the significance of. But if you did understand it as a situation of dual power, the Kornilov coup was obviously uh, um, deeply significant in what it meant. The Kornilov coup, or, or attempted coup, was obviously uh, an attempt by, first of all, by the provisional government to crush the Soviets. Because Korn the Kornilov coup happened because the, the provisional government, under Kerensky's leadership, uh, called in uh, Kornilov, who was the head of the army, to move out uh, various, um, oh no, sorry, to move into Petrograd. Uh, various uh, troops that were uh, not going to be as loyal to the, to the Soviets as the troops in Petrograd were, who'd been effectively won over to the Bolsheviks and to, and to the Soviet power structure. He called in new troops, or wanted to be called in new troops by uh, Kornilov in order to sort of uh, undermine the troops that were, the revolutionary troops that were in Petrograd. Um, so that in itself, the mere doing of that in itself already indicated the, an attempt to end dual power by the provisional government. Kornilov then obviously went, took it a step further by actually saying, well, why, not, why don't I take power and clear out all of the revolutionaries that are also in the provisional government, you know, the Mensheviks and others that are sitting in the, in the provisional government, um, and basically wanted to take power as a military dictator. And then, of course, Kerensky, fearing being supplanted himself, had no one to turn to but the Soviets themselves and basically the Bolsheviks, who he then uh, organised and they then um, organised a committee of defence or proposed a committee of defence to the Bolsheviks and others to defend the revolution against the counter-revolution of, of um, of Kornilov, and actually they were surprised because I think they didn't think, they think they thought the Bolsheviks were really sectarian and wouldn't agree with to, to work with them. But actually the Bolsheviks, of course, understanding the significance of this event, that it meant the decisive struggle for power between the Soviets and uh, the, the bourgeoisie, um, s agreed to it and, and seeing this, this instrument as a potential instrument for insurrection uh, and they agreed to it and basically then took it over. Um, <coughs> and the Kornilov coup, of course, um, uh, armed the working class, uh, or rather the, 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 the reaction against the Kornilov coup armed the working class effectively under the leadership of the Bolsheviks. It, and it, it created a red guard of 25,000 armed workers essentially to defend the city uh, from uh, Kornilov. And in this way I think you can see that the Kornilov coup is all important not just for the political lesson it gave the working class and sort of that, creating that final push, I think, of the working class into the arms of the Bolsheviks by making the workers see the danger of counter-revolution. Um, but it also, as well as that, quite specifically organised the working class into armed detachments um, uh, in order to defend the revolution and therefore also laid the technical basis for the seizure of power. Um, <clears throat> and this, this committee of defence that was created that gradually morphed into the Military Revolutionary Committee was then uh, used and pushed by the, by the Bolsheviks as a means then there to defend the Soviets and specifically the Second Congress of Soviets which was coming up under their uh, initiative um, to defend that, to defend that against the counter-revolution. And of course that wasn't a, a manufactured um, excuse really for, create, for using this military revolutionary committee. Of course it was a very real threat as the Kornilov coup showed. Um, but they posed it always in those defensive terms. We need to develop 
develop and establish this, uh, this military structure of the Soviets, essentially, to defend them from the, the, thre the threat of counter-revolution. They always pose things very cleverly to, to really make the workers realise, I think, that uh, we need to take power because that you can't have dual power forever. You can't have this situation. We have to either carry out a revolution under our leadership or just give up to a counter-revolution. They, they wanted to pose it in that way. And in doing so, of course, they made it clear that, that the, the, the Bolsheviks weren't trying to take power for themselves, but for the revolution. And that it should be the very revolution's own power structures. In other words, the Soviets, which were all party institutions. They weren't just Bolshevik institutions. That it should be done through the Soviets. In other words, through um, Soviet legality. And it f therefore flowed from the general demand of all power to the Soviets. It was an extension of that. <coughs> um, and of course, as you may know, uh, Lenin actually kind of generally disagreed with this, um, not on, as a matter of principle, but he found it to be another instance of prevaricating. He thought that the time was right for the seizure of power now, uh, and he was really anxious at any looking for an excuse to delay the insurrection, essentially, which is what I think he saw this this uh, posing of, of 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 it as a. Uh, something to defend the upcoming Congress of Soviets. So that meant a delay of the insurrection until the upcoming Congress of Soviets. He saw that as a delay that he, was dangerous and he thought once the time is ripe, the situation is on such a knife edge and is so tense, we have to seize that opportunity. We can't afford to just delay. Uh, uh, and, he, and he saw the delaying as perhaps an excuse to do nothing actually. Now he was wrong in doing so and he actually he effectively lost that argument to Trotsky and, and others. But ultimately played a brilliant role and was absolutely decisive in pushing for insurrection. The insurrection wouldn't have happened full stop, I think, if it weren't for him pushing and pushing it in that way. Um, and as Lenin was wont to do, I think he was bending the stick one way, uh, perhaps a bit too far, but bending it against um, being pushed in the other direction, in other words, in an opportunist direction or in a reformist direction, um, and perhaps bent it too far, but nevertheless played an absolutely uh, brilliant and decisive role in, in urging for this uh, insurrection to take place. So the, the committee of fence then becomes um, the actual the military revolutionary committee on the 16th of October as an all-party institution of, of the Soviets, i.e. not as a strictly speaking a Bolshevik institution. However the Mensheviks boycotted it by this point even though they originally proposed it. Um, and in fact to make to sort of make this point clear to the workers that this was not the Bolsheviks just seizing power on a, because they wanted it but actually this was uh, a legitimate organ of the workers' own organizations, the Soviets. Lazimir was appointed the head of this um of the Military Revolutionary Committee, and he was a left social revolutionary, he was not a Bolshevik. And in fact, under Trotsky's proposal, the way that the Military Revolutionary Committee was formed was uh, by ha taking in delegates from the Soviets, uh, from the soldiers' Soviets, uh, delegates from the fleet, that is the Navy, uh, the Railway Union, the factory representatives from the factory committees as well, which were slightly separate organisations to the Soviets, and also from the Red Guards that had been created. Uh, in the defense of Petrograd from Kornilov. So you can see how uh, it was quite clearly formed not as a party organization but as an all-party organization of the Soviets, although clearly under the Bolsheviks' impetus and leadership. And Lazimir then passed a resolution uh, in, uh, um, against the removal of troops, and I'll explain this in a second, from <coughs> Petrograd uh, in uh, the soldiers' section of the Petrograd Soviets by 281 to 1. Um, and really uh, from that point onwards all of the de decisive sections of the garrison of Petrograd, of the soldiers in Petrograd, really come under the organisational leadership of the Military Revolutionary Committee. And, uh, and uh, uh, regarding Regarding that, the, uh, this, I haven't explained this um, up, uh, yet, but this, this was really a decisive turning point in the struggle for power. Uh, it's a kind of like a sequel, if you like, or, um, or a, a, a much less dramatic sequel of the Kornilov attempt on power, which was that after having called in Kornilov to bring in troops that were 
perhaps hostile to the revolution or loyal to the provisional government into Petrograd. Now the provisional government attempted on the 11th of October to move the troops that were in Petrograd that were loyal to the revolution outside of Petrograd. You know, these troops had come, generally come under the leadership of the Soviet and, and the, you know, were, were sympathetic to the, to the Bolsheviks, etc. They issued an order they should be sent to the front to fight in the, in the, in the war. Uh, and everyone immediately understood the significance of this and the danger of it. Hence, Lazimir moving this resolution in the soldier section of the Petrograd Soviet against that. And when they did that, when they effectively nullified that order, they had created not just <coughs> political dual power, but they had really stepped up into military dual power, if you like. Now there was a situation where the military was obeying really the orders and the authority of the Soviet power structure and not that of the provisional government. And Trotsky says that really that point onwards, that was actually the beginning of the insurrection, although it was maybe not fully understood at that time. The day before that, on the 10th of October, um, uh, a resolution had passed in the Bolshevik Central Committee by 10 votes to 2 in favour of organising the insurrection. So by this time, uh, Lenin has won over the leadership of the Bolshevik Party to the idea of insurrection. Um, and, and then, of course, this, this decisive thing happens, kind of falls into the lap, really, of, 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 the, uh, of the Bolsheviks where the, uh, the, um, the Petrograd garrison was attempted to be moved out, but then, but then wasn't. And that really put the ball in their court. It gave them control of the situation. From this point onwards, the Military Revolutionary Committee really goes forward and organises quite s smoothly and brilliantly uh, the dissolving of the power structures uh, and the, the, the apparatus of coercion of the old state apparatus and, uh, and, and absorbs them into, the, into the, the chain of command, if you like, of the Military Revolutionary Committee and the Soviets. The main one being the Petrograd garrison that I've just mentioned. But once that happened, many other you know, military organisations in and around Petrograd announced that they will really only follow orders of the, the Soviets. Also, you have uh, much initiative being taken from below by the workers, uh, such as, for instance, um, orders for arms to be sent uh, to the front and, and, and really being... Um, intercepted and by the workers in those arms factories basically saying no we're not going to do that actually we'll send those arms and ammunition to the red guards uh, uh, in order to arm the insurrection essentially um, there are many many examples uh, along these lines another really good example is uh, that of the bicycle men who were a kind of an elite of of the um, uh, of the uh, of the military, uh, who were not seen as loyal to the revolution because they were more elite, essentially more privileged, and obviously being on bikes, kind of, kind of like a modern version of the cavalry, I suppose. Um, slightly co comical uh, image that it creates, but anyway, they were um, they were ordered. I think I, I can't remember the details, but they were ordered, I think, to go in and uh, to move into Petrograd in order to defend Petrograd from from uh, the coming insurrection, which the the provisional government was sort of vaguely anticipating um, but they I think what happened is that the bicycle men their leader would, wanted to check the order wasn't quite sure of the order or something so then like kind of telephoned to someone in the army or something along those lines and that that conversation was intercepted by tr uh, troops that were loyal to the Soviets and to the military revolutionary committee and they, they informed the military revolutionary committee who then basically sent a message to these bicycle men to have a meeting with them which they then did and they basically won them over to the revolution or to the insurrection or at the very least pacified them so they couldn't be used they couldn't be relied upon from that point onwards to attack the insurrection or to attack uh, the seizure of power and there, there were a great many events uh, such as that in the seizure of power and you see at that time really that the military revolution committee has kind of an all-seeing eye because the workers have become so organized so interconnected with each other and so class conscious and determined under the bold and confident leadership of the Bolsheviks that they begin to take initiatives on their own behalf and they they intercept things on their own initiative you know they hear things they say such as in this example and they relay it to the military revolutionary committee
In general, the Military Revolution Committee is in, is in touch with everything. It sent commissars to sort of represent it in every <laughs> military organisation uh, in and around Petrograd. Um, kept in touch with everything. On the days of the insurrection, uh, revolutionary workers would go to, the, to Smolny, which was the building that housed the Military Revolutionary Committee headquarters, throughout the night to get updates on what was going on, because that was the epicentre, you know, that knew everything. And in that way, that ho the working class of Petrograd became organised and self-aware to an unprecedented degree and able to go forward with ex extreme confidence and carry out uh, the smooth seizure of power. And I think that really proves correct to Trotsky's point that the, Bolshe that, sorry, that the workers' revolution is much more planned, much more organised and conscious than is a bourgeois revolution, which is a, somewhat of a more chaotic and incomplete affair, as we know. But the decisive step is still not taken here, and this is something I would like to emphasise. It's a lesson that we need to take from the insurrection, the concreteness of it. Because it's not enough at this point just to have developed all of this interconnectedness of the workers, even to arm the workers. The, the decisive step is still not here taken. That is to say, the banks, the post office, the telegraph agency, you know, <clears throat> the power stations, uh, it's all of these key institutions of running society have not been seized and interconnected, nor has the old government been arrested and publicly pro proclaimed and shown to be powerless, nor has a new power been publicly announced and proven to be the only power that can run society. That's really, if you're going to run and create a new society on, on completely different lines, on socialist lines, that's obviously what you need to do. You can't do what they did in the Spanish revolution where you kind of from below seize all of the factories the anarchist workers that's what they did they seized all of the factories and then being anarchists who don't like centralism and power thought that that was enough and they said we've created what they called a new social economy that's it we've taken the factories um, and that's it we've done it but of course they hadn't touched the old government they hadn't broken their link with the army, they hadn't done all of those things, and they hadn't proclaimed to, to the world, we are the power that runs Spanish society. And that vagueness allowed the old state to kind of recover its nerve, to re-establish some military organisation and to go on the offensive and to shut down workers' control, etc. But of course, in Russia, they didn't do that. They actually did go forwards and organise the taking of power. So on that fateful night before the calling of the Second Congress of Soviets, they seized power throughout the night, all of the key, these key uh, places, inclu including especially, of course, the Winter Palace, but also the post offices, the telegraph agency, the telephone exchange, the power stations, the water supply, all of these were seized, and which was very easy to do because the workers in many of these places, of course, already supported the revolution. But they were seized, and then, of course, the government ministers were arrested uh, in the Winter Palace bloodlessly. All of it very bloodless, very smooth. In fact, when this took place, there were many examples of um, attempts at looting by perhaps just people on the street or meet maybe more rank and file elements of the insurrection who thought they could you know really take advantage of the situation and red got responsible red guards would stop them and would say don't stain the proletarian victory you know and even despite this there were still rumors circulated that it was all just chaos and they were looting and raping and pillaging which was false as the quote i gave at the beginning shows in fact there's many quotes uh, from counter-revolutionaries, they almost can't believe it's an insurrection. They think an insurrection can't be surely this smooth and organised and open. Surely, it <laughs> uh, but it but it was, and it was, uh, and f obviously many people concluded therefore it was a coup, and it was a sort of conspiratorial seizure of power. Actually, that proves precisely the opposite. It pr proves that it was so popular, and and uh, as I've described, it was so well organised, and it could be so well organised because of just how organised the working class had become. Uh, that it, that it could do it in such a smooth manner. They also seized, and this is of a special significance, the state bank, showing that they had learned, quite consciously learned the lesson of the Paris Commune, where of course, in a more spontaneous manner, <clears throat> they seized Paris, uh, but didn't take the state bank and basically left that in the hands of the counter-revolution to finance and organize the counter-revolution, which they did, but they didn't do that in, in Russia, obviously having learned that lesson. Um, now, the final point then I just want to make, 
<clears throat> is that in relation to this, the, the anarchist conception of revolution, the anarchist idea that you can, you don't need a party, in fact that a party is the biggest enemy of a revolution, you don't need any kind of central apparatus, to imagine that this degree, this overturn of, of such tremendous significance that doesn't just, you know, overwhelm the old power but put something in its place. To imagine that that can be done, that such a concrete act can be done without organisation and planning, without making sure that you have loyal troops in all of the key strategic places of the city so that you can't be destroyed by the counter-revolution or starved uh, into submission. To imagine that just spontaneously emerges I think is frankly absurd and when you pose it in this clear and concrete way rather than talking in the vague abstraction as to whether or not leaderships are inherently bad or something, when you pose it in that clear way I think it becomes so obvious that you couldn't do it in any other way. You can, I think, organise a revolution spontaneously, but you can't organise a socialist insurrection, which you do need to have. And we've seen in the February Revolution that was effectively entirely spontaneous and without leadership. Also Tahrir Square in Egypt a few years ago, pretty much entirely spontaneous and without leadership. And it, it, the, both of them did succeed in toppling the old regime, or rather the figurehead of the old regime. They did succeed in that. But a socialist revolution isn't just the undermining of the old power and the, the sort of decapitating of the old power so that the new privileged and powerful can rush in and fill the vacuum, which of course is what they did in February. It's not just that, it's a fundamental reorganisation of society that requires, uh, that ch challenges and, and destroys even the old privileges and power of the old ruling class at every level. So you can't just leave it to chance in that way. You can't just satisfy yourself with removing the czar or some other figurehead. You've got to, if you're really serious about a socialist tra transformation of society, you've got to grasp that it's not acceptable to the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie can reconcile itself to losing Mubarak or the czar and then can take advantage of that new situation. They cannot reconcile themselves to losing their banks, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their factories and all the rest of it, which is really what a socialist transformation of society needs. So you've got to be serious about this. You've got to plan it. Uh, and also you, the workers need to know. Workers may be entirely revolutionary. Then all of the workers, let's say, which is a bit over the top, but let's just say all of the workers are in favour of a socialist revolution, which you'll never have. You'll never have 100% of the workers. But even if you did, that still is not enough. They need to know that it's being planned. Otherwise, how is it going to happen? Is, is one random worker just going to put their hand up and say, I propose that on the 15th of so-and-so we arrest the government? And, and how are they going to make sure that all the other workers have understood that and are, and are with them in it? You need an ins a universally recognised and legitimate instrument, in other words, a party, that everybody knows the name of and supports, to, to propose, as Trotsky said, to set a date for the insurrection and to actually concretely organise it, not undemocratically, of course, to do it when you have the mass support and to canvas for that support and, and to, to make sure that... The, and in doing so, of course, you, you actually give the workers more confidence, not less. It's not true what the anarchists say, that it somehow all leaderships just pacify and depress the workers. Actually, they can raise them up to a higher level if they're a good leadership. I think it's frankly ridiculous to imagine that can happen without this such an instrument. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll finish there. Okay.